Chapter 4 of The Story of a Common Soldier of Army Life in the Civil War, 1861-1865. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. The Story of a Common Soldier of Army Life in the Civil War by Leander Stilwell. CHAPTER Four, SOME INCIDENTS OF THE BATTLE OF SHILOH There were many little incidents at Shiloh that came under my personal observation that I did not mention in the foregoing sketch. The matter of space was important, so I passed them over. But that consideration does not arise now, and, as I am writing this for you, I will say something here about several things that I think may be of some interest. I distinctly remember my first shot at Shiloh. It was fired when we were in our first position, as described in my account of the battle. I think that when the boys saw the enemy advancing, they began firing of their own motion, without waiting for orders. At least, I don't remember hearing any. I was in the front rank, but didn't fire. I preferred to wait for a good opportunity when I could take deliberate aim at some individual foe. But when the regiment fired, the Confederates halted and began firing also, and the fronts of both lines were at once shrouded in smoke. I had my gun at a ready, and was trying to peer under the smoke in order to get a sight of our enemies. Suddenly I heard someone in a highly excited tone calling to me from just in my rear, Stillwell, shoot, shoot! why don't you shoot? I looked around and saw that this command was being given by Bob Wilder, our second lieutenant, who was in his place just a few steps to the rear. He was a young man, about twenty-five years old, and was fairly wild with excitement, jumping up and down like a hen on a hot griddle. Why, lieutenant, said I, I can't see anything to shoot at. Shoot, shoot, anyhow. "'All right,' I responded. "'If you say shoot, shoot it is.' And, bringing my gun to my shoulder, I aimed low in the direction of the enemy and blazed away through the smoke. I have always doubted if this, my first shot, did any execution, but there's no telling. However, the lieutenant was clearly right. Our adversaries were in our front, in easy range, and it was our duty to aim low, fire in their general direction, and let fate do the rest. But at the time the idea to me was ridiculous that one should blindly shoot into a cloud of smoke without having a bead on the object to be shot at. I had shot squirrels and rabbits and other small game in the big woods adjacent to our backwoods home from the time I was big enough to carry a gun. In fact, I began when I was too small to shoot offhand, but had to fire from a rest any convenient stump, log, or forked bush. The gun I used was a little old percussion lock rifle with a long barrel, carrying a bullet which weighed about sixty to the pound. We boys had to furnish our own ammunition, lead, which we molded into bullets, gun caps, and powder. Our principal source of revenue whereby we got money to buy ammunition was hazelnuts, which we would gather, shuck, and sell at five cents a quart. And the work incident to the gathering and shucking of a quart of hazelnuts was a decidedly tedious job, but it made us economical in the use of our ordnance stores, so we would never throw away a shot carelessly or unnecessarily. And it was a standing rule never to shoot a squirrel anywhere except in the head save as a last resort when circumstances compelled one to fire at some other part of the body of the little animal. And so I thought, at the beginning of my military career, that I should use the same care and circumspection in firing an old musket when on the line of battle that I had exercised in hunting squirrels. But I learned better in about the first five minutes of the Battle of Shiloh. However, in every action I was in, when the opportunity was afforded, I took careful and deliberate aim, but many a time the surroundings were such that the only thing to do was to hold low and fire through the smoke in the direction of the enemy. 
I will say here that the extent of wild shooting done in battle, especially by raw troops, is astonishing, and rather hard to understand. When we fell back to our second line at Shiloh, I heard an incessant humming sound away up above our heads, like the flight of a swarm of bees. In my ignorance I at first hardly knew what that meant, but it presently dawned on me that the noise was caused by bullets singing through the air from twenty to a hundred feet over our heads, and after the battle I noticed that the big trees in our camp, just in the rear of our second line, were thickly pockmarked by musket balls at a distance of fully a hundred feet from the ground, and yet we were separated from the Confederates only by a little narrow field, and the intervening ground was perfectly level. But the fact is, those boys were fully as green as we were, and doubtless as much excited. The Confederate army at Shiloh was composed of soldiers, the great majority of whom went under fire there for the first time, and I reckon they were as nervous and badly scared as we were. I shall never forget how awfully I felt on seeing for the first time a man killed in battle. This occurred on our second position, above mentioned. Our line of battle here was somewhat irregular, and the men had become mixed up. The trees and stumps were thick, and we availed ourselves of their protection whenever possible. I had a tree. It was embarrassingly small, but better than none. I took to a log later but there was a man just on my right behind a tree of generous proportions, and I somewhat envied him. He was actively engaged in loading and firing, and was standing up to the work well when I last saw him alive, but all at once there he was lying on his back at the foot of his tree, with one leg doubled under him, motionless and stone dead. He probably had been hit square in the head while aiming or peeking around the tree. I stared at his body, perfectly horrified. Only a few seconds ago that man was alive and well, and now he was lying on the ground, done for, forever. The event came nearer completely upsetting me than anything else that occurred during the entire battle, but I got used to such incidents in the course of the day. After rallying at our third position, we were moved a short distance to the rear, and formed in line at right angles to the road from our camp to the landing. While standing there, I casually noticed a large wall tent at the side of the road, a few steps to my rear. It was closed up, and nobody stirring around it. Suddenly I heard right over our heads a frightful swish, and followed by a loud crash in this tent. Looking around, I saw a big gaping hole in the wall of the tent, and on the other side got a glimpse of the cause of the disturbance, a big cannonball ricocheting down the ridge and hunting further mischief. And at the same moment of time the front flaps of the tent were frantically thrown open, and out popped a fellow in citizen's clothes. He had a Hebrew visage, his face was as white as a dead man's, and his eyes were sticking out like a crawfish's. He started down the road toward the landing at probably the fastest gait he had ever made in his life, his coat-tails streaming behind him, and the boys yelling at him. We proceeded to investigate the interior of that tent at once, and found that it was a sutler's establishment, and crammed with sutler goods. The panic-struck individual who had just vacated it was, of course, the proprietor. He had adopted ostrich tactics, had buttoned himself up in the tent, and was in there, keeping as still as a mouse, thinking, perhaps, that, as he could see nobody, nobody could see him. That cannonball must have been a rude surprise. In order to have plenty of han romance, we tore down the tent at once, and then proceeded to appropriate the contents. There were barrels of apples, bologna sausages, cheeses, canned oysters and sardines, and lots of other truck. I was filling my haversack with bologna when Colonel Fry rode up to me and said, My son, will you please give me a link of that sausage? Under the circumstances, I reckon I must have been feeling somewhat impudent and reckless, so I answered rather saucily, Certainly, Colonel, we are closing out this morning below cost. 
and I thrust into his hands two or three big links of bologna. There was a faint trace of a grin on the old man's face as he took the provender, and he began gnawing at once on one of the hunks, while the others he stowed away in his equipments. I suspected from this incident that the colonel had had no breakfast that morning, which perhaps may have been the case. Soon after this I made another deal. There were some cavalry in line close by us, and one of them called out to me, "'Pardner, give me some of them apples.' "'You bet,' said I, and quickly filling my cap with the fruit, handed it to him. He emptied the apples into his haversack, took a silver dime from his pocket, and proffered it to me, saying, "'Here, keep your money, don't want it,' was my response. But he threw the coin at my feet, and I picked it up and put it in my pocket." it came agreeably handy later. Jack Medford of my company came up to me with a most complacent look on his face, and patting his haversack said, Lee, I just now got a whole lot of paper and envelopes, and am fixing for writing home about this battle. Seems to me, Jack, I suggested, you'd better unload that stuff and get something to eat. Don't worry about writing home about the battle till it's done fought. Jack's countenance changed, he muttered, "'Reckon you're right, Lee.' And when next I saw him, his haversack was bulging with bologna and cheese. All this time the battle was raging furiously on our right, and occasionally a cannonball, flying high, went screaming over our heads. Walter Scott, in The Lady of the Lake, in describing an incident in the Battle of Beale, Audun, speaks of the unearthly screaming and yelling that occurred, sounding, as if all the fiends from heaven that fell had pealed the banner cry of hell. That comparison leaves much for the imagination, but speaking from experience, I will say that of all the blood-curdling sounds I ever heard, the worst is the terrific scream of a cannonball or shell passing close over one's head, especially that kind with a cavity in the base that sucks in air. At least they sounded that way until I got used to them. As a matter of fact, artillery in my time was not near as dangerous as musketry. It was noisy, but didn't kill often unless at close range and firing grape and canister. As stated in the preceding sketch, sometime during the forenoon the regiment was sent to the support of a battery and remained there for some hours. The most trying situation in battle is one where you have to lie flat on the ground, under fire, more or less, and without any opportunity to return it. The constant strain on the nerves is almost intolerable. So it was with feelings of grim but heartfelt relief that we finally heard the colonel command, Attention, battalion! Our turn had come at last. We sprang to our feet with alacrity and were soon in motion, marching by the flank diagonally towards the left, from whence for some hours had been proceeding heavy firing. We had not gone far before I saw something which hardly had an inspiring effect. We were marching along an old grass-grown country road with a rail fence on the right, which enclosed a sort of woods pasture, and with a dense forest on our left, when I saw a soldier on our left slowly making his way to the rear. He had been struck a sort of glancing shot on the left side of his face, and the skin and flesh of his cheek were hanging in shreds. His face and neck were covered with blood, and he was a frightful sight. Yet he seemed to be perfectly cool and composed, and wasn't taking on a bit. As he came opposite my company, he looked up at us and said, "'Give em hell, boys. They've spoiled my beauty.' It was manifest that he was not exaggerating." When we were thrown into line on our new position and began firing, I was in the front rank, and my rear rank man was Philip Potter, a young Irishman who was some years my senior. When he fired his first shot, he came very near putting me out of action. I think that the muzzle of his gun could not have been more than two or three inches from my right ear. The shock of the report almost deafened me at the time, and my neck and right cheek were peppered with powder grains which remained there for years, until finally absorbed in the system. I turned to Phil in a fury, exclaiming, "'What in the hell and damnation do you mean?' Just then down went the man on my right with a sharp cry, and followed by the one on the left. 
both apparently severely wounded. The thought of my shocking conduct in thus indulging in wicked profanity at such a time flashed upon me, and I almost held my breath expecting summary punishment on the spot. But nothing of the kind happened, and, according to history, Washington swore a good deal worse at the Battle of Monmouth, and Potter was more careful thereafter. Poor Phil! On December 7, 1864, while fighting on the skirmish line near Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and just a few paces to my left, he was mortally wounded by a gunshot in the bowels, and died in the hospital a few days later. He was a Catholic, and in his last hours was almost frantic, because no priest was at hand to grant him absolution. Right after we began firing on this line, I noticed directly in my front and not more than two hundred yards away a large Confederate flag flapping defiantly in the breeze. The smoke was too dense to enable me to see the bearer, but the banner was distinctly visible. It looked hateful to me, and I wanted to see it come down. So I held on it, let my gun slowly fall until I thought the sights were about on a waistline, and then fired. I peered eagerly under the smoke to see the effect of my shot, but the blamed thing was still flying. I fired three or four more shots on the same line as the first, but with no apparent results. I then concluded that the bear was probably squatted behind a stump or something, and that it was useless to waste ammunition on him. Diagonally to my left, perhaps 250 yards away, the Confederate line of battle was in plain sight. It was in the open, in the edge of an old field with woods to the rear. It afforded a splendid mark. Even the ramrods could be seen flashing in the air as the men, while in the act of loading, drew and returned the rammers. Thereupon I began firing at the enemy on that part of the line and the balance of the contents of my cartridge box went in that direction. It was impossible to tell if any of my shots took effect, but after the battle I went to the spot and looked over the ground. The Confederate dead lay there thick, and I wondered, as I looked at them, if I had killed any of those poor fellows. Of course I didn't know, and am glad now that I didn't. And I will say here that I do not now have any conclusive knowledge that during my entire term of service I ever killed, or even wounded, a single man. It is more than probable that some of my shots were fatal, but I don't know it, and am thankful for the ignorance. You see, after all, the common soldiers of the Confederate armies were American boys, just like us, and conscientiously believed that they were right. Had they been soldiers of a foreign nation, Spaniards, for instance, I might feel differently. When we went in on the above-mentioned position, old Captain Reddish took his place in the ranks and fought like a common soldier. He had picked up the musket of some dead or wounded man and filled his pockets with cartridges and gun caps, and so was well provided with ammunition. He unbuckled his sword from the belt and laid it in the scabbard at his feet and proceeded to give his undivided attention to the enemy. I can now see the old man in my mind's eye as he stood in the ranks, loading and firing, his blue-gray eyes flashing, and his face lighted up with the flame of battle. Colonel Fry happened to be near us at one time, and I heard old Captain John yell at him, "'Injun fightin', Colonel, just like injun fightin'!' When we finally retired, the captain shouldered his musket and trotted off with the rest of us, oblivious of his cheese-knife, as he called it, left it lying on the ground, and never saw it again. There was a battery of light artillery on this line, about a quarter of a mile to our right, on a slight elevation of the ground. It was right flush up with the infantry line of battle, and, oh, how those artillerymen handled their guns! It seemed to me that there was the roar of a cannon from that battery about every other second. When ramming cartridge, I sometimes glanced in that direction. The men were big fellows, stripped to the waist, their white skins flashing in the sunlight, and they were working like I have seen men doing when fighting a big fire in the woods. I fairly gloated over the fire of that battery, 
Give it to them, my sons of thunder, I would say to myself. Knock the everlasting stuffing out of them. And, as I ascertained after the battle, they did do frightful execution. In consideration of the fact that, nowadays, as you know, I refuse to even kill a chicken, some of the above expressions may sound rather strange. But the fact is, a soldier on the fighting line is possessed by the demon of destruction. He wants to kill and the more of his adversaries he can see killed, the more intense his gratification. General Grant somewhere in his memoirs expresses the idea, only in milder language than mine, when he says, While a battle is raging, one can see his enemy mowed down by the thousand or the ten thousand with great composure. The regiment bivouacked for the night on the bluff, not far from the historic log house, Rain set in about dark, and not wanting to lie in the water, I hunted around and found a little brush pile, evidently made by some man from a sapling he had cut down and trimmed up some time past when the leaves were on the trees. I made a sort of pillow out of my gun, cartridge box, haversack, and canteen, and stretched myself out on the brush pile, tired to death, and rather discouraged over the events of the day. The main body of Buell's men, the Army of the Ohio, soon after dark began ascending the bluff at a point a little above the landing, and forming in line in the darkness a short distance beyond. I have a shadowy impression that this lasted the greater part of the night. Their regimental bands played continuously, and it seemed to me that they all played the tune of The Girl I Left Behind Me and the rain drizzled down while every fifteen minutes one of the big navy guns roared and sent a ponderous shell shrieking up the ravine above in the direction of the enemy. To this day, whenever I hear an instrumental band playing, the girl I left behind me, there come to me the memories of that gloomy Sunday night at Pittsburgh Landing. I again hear the ceaseless patter of the rain, the dull, heavy tread of Buell's marching columns, the thunderous roar of the navy guns, the demonical scream of the projectile, and, mingled with it all, the sweet, plaintive music of that old song. We had an army version of it I have never seen in print, altogether different from the original ballad. The last stanza of this army production was as follows. If I ever get through this war, and a rebel ball don't find me, I'll shape my course by the northern star to the girl I left behind me. I have said elsewhere that the regiment was not engaged on Monday. We remained all that day at the place where we bivouacked Sunday night. The ends of the staffs of our regimental flags were driven in the ground, the banners flapping idly in the breeze, while the men sat or lay around with their guns in their hands or lying by them, their cartridge boxes buckled on, and all ready to fall in line at the tap of the drum. But for some reason I never knew we were not called on. Our division commander, General B. M. Prentice, and our brigade commander, Colonel Madison Miller, were both captured on Sunday with the bulk of Prentice's division. So I reckon we were sort of lost children. But we were not alone. There were also other regiments of Grant's command which were held in reserve and did not fire a shot on Monday. After the battle I roamed around over the field, the most of the following two days, looking at what was to be seen. The fearful sights apparent on a bloody battlefield simply cannot be described in all their horror. They must be seen in order to be fully realized. As Byron somewhere in Don Juan truly says, Mortality, thou hast thy monthly bills, thy plagues, thy famines, thy physicians, yet tick like the death-watch within our ears, the ills past, present, and to come, but all may yield to the true portrait of one battlefield. There was a small clearing on the battlefield called the Peach Orchard Field. It was of irregular shape and about fifteen or twenty acres in extent, as I remember, However, I cannot now be sure as to the exact size. 
It got its name probably from the fact that there were on it a few scraggy peach trees. The Union troops on Sunday had a strong line in the woods just north of the field, and the Confederates made four successive charges across this open space on our line, all of which were repulsed with frightful slaughter. I walked all over this piece of ground the day after the close of the battle, and before the dead had been buried. It is the simple truth to say that this space was literally covered with the Confederate dead, and one could have walked all over it on their bodies. General Grant, in substance, makes the same statement in his memoirs. It was a fearful sight. But not far from the peach orchard field, in a westerly direction, was a still more gruesome spectacle. Some of our forces were in line on an old grass-grown country road that ran through thick woods. The wheels of wagons running for many years right in the same ruts had cut through the turf, so that the surface of the road was somewhat lower than the adjacent ground. To men firing on their knees, this afforded a slight natural breastwork which was substantial protection. In front of this position, in addition to the large timber, was a dense growth of small underbrush, post-oak and the like, which had not yet shed their leaves, and the ground was also covered with layers of dead leaves. There was desperate fighting at this point, and during its progress exploding shells set the woods on fire. The clothing of the dead Confederates lying in these woods caught fire, and their bodies were burned to a crisp. I have read somewhere that some wounded men were burned to death, but I doubt that. I walked all over the ground looking at these poor fellows, and scrutinized them carefully to see the nature of their hurts, and they had evidently been shot dead, or expired in a few seconds after being struck. But in any event, the sight was horrible. I will not go into details, but leave it to your imagination. I noticed at other places on the field the bodies of two Confederate soldiers whose appearances I shall never forget. They presented a remarkable contrast of death in battle. One was a full-grown man, seemingly about thirty years of age, with sandy, reddish hair and a scrubby beard and mustache of the same color. He had been firing from behind a tree, had exposed his head, and had been struck square in the forehead by a musket ball, killed instantly, and had dropped at the foot of the tree in a heap. He was in the act of biting a cartridge when struck. His teeth were still fastened on the paper extremity, while his right hand clutched the bullet end. His teeth were long and snaggy, and discolored by tobacco juice. As just stated, he had been struck dead, seemingly instantaneously. His eyes were wide open and gleaming with satanic fury. His transition from life to death had been immediate, with the result that there was indelibly stamped on his face all the furious rage and lust of battle. He was an ill-looking fellow, and all in all was not an agreeable object to contemplate. The other was a far different case. He was lying on a sloping ridge where the Confederates had charged a battery, and had suffered fearfully. He was a mere boy, not over eighteen, with regular features, light brown hair, blue eyes, and, generally speaking, was strikingly handsome. He had been struck on his right leg, above the knee, about midway the thigh, by a cannon ball, which had cut off the limb, except a small strip of skin. He was lying on his back, at full length, his right arm straight up in the air, rigid as a stake, and his fist tightly clinched. His eyes were wide open, but their expression was calm and natural. The shock and the loss of blood doubtless brought death to his relief in a short time. As I stood looking at the unfortunate boy, I thought of how some poor mother's heart would be well-nigh broken when she heard of the sad, untimely fate of her darling son. But before the war was over, doubtless thousands of similar cases occurred in both the Union and Confederate armies. I believe I will here speak of a notion of mine, to be considered for whatever you may think it worth. As you know, 
I am not a religious man in the theological sense of the term, having never belonged to a church in my life, have just tried to the best of my ability to act according to the golden rule, and let it go at that. But from my earliest youth I have had a peculiar reverence for Sunday. I hunted much with a gun when a boy, and so did the people generally of my neighborhood. Small game in that backwoods region was very plentiful, and even deer were not uncommon. Well, it was a settled conviction with us primitive people that if one went hunting on Sunday, he would not only have bad luck in that regard that day, but also all the rest of the week. So, when the Confederates began the battle on Sunday, I would keep thinking throughout its entire progress, you fellows started this on Sunday, and you'll get licked. I admit that there were a few occasions when things looked so awful bad that I became discouraged, but I quickly rallied, and my Sunday superstition, or whatever it may be called, was justified in the end. In addition to Shiloh, the battles of New Orleans in 1815, Waterloo, and Bull Run were fought on a Sunday, and in each case the attacking party was signally defeated. These results may have been mere coincidences, but I don't think so. I have read somewhere an authentic statement that President Lincoln entertained this same belief, and always was opposed to aggressive movements on Sundays by the Union troops. The wildest possible rumors got into circulation at home about some of the results of the battle. I have now lying before me an old letter from my father of date April 19th, in answer to mine, which I will mention later, giving him the first definite intelligence about our regiment and the neighborhood boys. Among other things, he said, We have had it here that Fry's regiment was all captured that was not killed, pretty much all given up as lost, that Beauregard had run you all down a steep place into the Tennessee River, that Captain Reddish had his arm shot off, that Enoch Wallace was also wounded, and here followed the names of some others who, the same as Reddish and Wallace, hadn't received even a scratch. My letter to my father mentioned above was dated April 10th, and received by him on the 18th. It was brief, occupying only about four pages of the small, sleazy note-paper that we bought in those days of the sutlers. I don't remember why I didn't write sooner, but it was probably because no mail-boat left the landing until about that time. The old mail hack ordinarily arrived at the Otter Creek Post Office from the outside world an hour or so before sundown, and the evening my letter came, the little post office and general store was crowded with people intensely anxious to hear from their boys or other relatives of the 61st Illinois. The distribution of letters in that office in those times was a proceeding of much simplicity. The old clerk who attended to that would call out in a stentorian tone the name of the addressee of each letter, who, if present, would respond, Here! and then the letter would be given a dexterous flip and went flying to him across the room. But on this occasion there were no letters from the regiment until just at the last the clerk called my father's name, J. O. Stillwell, and again still louder, but there was no response. Whereupon the clerk held the letter at arm's length and carefully scrutinized the address. Well, he said finally, this is from Jerry Stillwell's boy in the 61st. So I reckon he's not killed, anyhow. A murmur of excitement went through the room at this, and the people crowded up to get a glimpse of even the handwriting of the address. Yes, that's from Jerry's boy, sure, said several. Thereupon William Noble and Joseph Beeman, who were old friends of father's, begged the postmaster to give them the letter, and they would go straight out to Stillwell's with it and have him read it, and then they would come right back with the news. Everybody seconded the request. The postmaster acceded and handed one of them the letter. They rushed out, unfastened their horses, and left in a gallop for Stillwell's, two miles away, on the south side of Otter Creek, out in the woods. As they dashed up to the little old log cabin, they saw my father out near the barn. The one with the letter waved it aloft, calling at the top of his voice, "'Letter from your boy, Jerry!' 
My mother heard this, and she came running from the house, trembling with excitement. The letter was at once opened and read, and the terrible reports which to that time had prevailed about the fate of Fry's regiment vanished in the air. It's true it contained some sad news, but nothing to be compared with the frightful accounts which had been rife in the neighborhood. I have that old letter in my possession now. Soon after the battle, Governor Richard Yates of Illinois, Governor Louis P. Harvey of Wisconsin, and many other civilians came down from the north to look after the comfort of the sick and wounded soldiers of their respective states. The 16th Wisconsin Infantry was camped next to us, and I learned one afternoon that Governor Harvey was to make a speech that evening after dress parade, and I went over to hear him. The Wisconsin Regiment did not turn out in military formation, just gathered around him in a dense group under a grove of trees. The Governor sat on a horse while making his speech. He wore a large, broad-brimmed hat, his coat was buttoned to the chin, and he had big buckskin gauntlets on his hands. He was a fine-looking man, heavy-set, and about forty-two years old. His remarks were not lengthy, but were patriotic and eloquent. I remember especially how he complimented the Wisconsin soldiers for their good conduct in battle, that their state was proud of them, and that he, as governor, intended to look after them, and care for them to the very best of his ability, as long as he was in office, and that when the time came for him to relinquish that trust, he would still remember them with interest and the deepest affection. His massive frame heaved with the intensity of his feelings as he spoke, and he impressed me as being absolutely sincere in all that he said, but he little knew nor apprehended the sad and lamentable fate then pending over him. Only a few evenings later, as he was crossing the gangplank between two steamboats at the landing, in some manner he fell from the plank and was sucked under the boats by the current and drowned. Some days later a negro found his body lodged against some drift near our side of the river, and he brought it in his old cart inside our lines. From papers on the body and other evidence, it was conclusively identified as that of Governor Harvey. The remains were shipped back to Wisconsin, where they were given a largely attended and impressive funeral. End of chapter 4